Thank you very much. Uh, well, it's a big pleasure to be here and also a challenge because uh, to share our challenges and our projects is uh, one of the interesting aspects of this visit. To, this is my third time to this nice country uh, with people that we know since many years ago and, and also meeting people that we have been working in Scotland several years ago and some friends here. And I wish to thank the Cervantes Institute and the, the Council and also Luis Salvador Carulla and also my boss here, which is uh, Maripao Gomez. <laughs> Uh, it's one of my bosses, that they don't talk to each other, which is a good thing. And then uh, also the Ministry of Health, the, the, the no New South Wales Ministry of Health, because as you, as you have been uh, knowing, uh, I'm devoted to give support in our organization to Ministries of Health and Organization to develop public health policies in palliative care. This is our main job. Uh, well, this is, this is not Egyptian. This is uh, something my father said, but my father was a retired GP and he was very clinical, you know, and he said, what are you really doing in, in your hospital? What do you really do? And I made this just to keep him uh, worried about me. And also you can say that they have a lot of... Um, a lot of bosses, and they don't talk to each other. The day they will talk to each other, they will fire me out, probably, <laughs> because I am never in one of these settings. Okay, but we do a lot of uh, academic research, and uh, lately, epidemiology and effectiveness and uh, efficiency of services and programs uh, with a WHO perspective, because we run these WHO collaborating centers and also this chair, bringing together primary care physicians, geriatrics and community, and also palliative care, and this observatory. Well, this is a long list of things that we can share, but I will rush into this um, uh, lecture because uh, we could have a bit of time to, to talk, and also during the day, uh, I will be delighted to share with you the challenges and also the dilemmas we have in the implementation of public health policies for palliative care. Uh, and these are the dilemmas that we can share. Perhaps you have a longer list, but this is how to extend palliative care to all people in need of palliative care in all settings of the healthcare system and also the social system. And to look after all dimensions timely and looking after all the needs they have in all health and social settings and all countries in, in, in all countries in the world? And then how can we um, go forward in the role of specialized service uh, of palliative care that we have been developing in many countries as you did in, in Australia? And how can we make it uh, sustainable and, uh, and make accountability of this and bring in results to society, mainly involving society in this developing. Well, I will keep a, a bit more in this one because this was the conceptual framework we have been working since 10 years ago. As you did in Australia, we were focused many years in cancer, terminal cancer, palliative care, based in specialized services of palliative care. And we have a good model in Spain. I will talk about this afterwards. But we were um, all uh, very um, interested in developing a new frame, a conceptual frame uh, of palliative care provision from cancer to non-cancer, but from disease to conditions. Because uh, we'll see afterwards that the most prevalent issue is multimorbidity and conditions that are not only one disease, especially linked to elderly uh, and aging society and also from mortality to prevalence. You did very good research in Australia, Beverly McNamara. Uh, she's very well known in Europe uh, because she started to work on the epidemiology of mortality palliative care. But we have been developing models of looking at the prevalence, which is how many people today in our settings need palliative care. It means that this is uh, 
a rising tide or a tsunami of needs which is coming from cancer to non-cancer and also from terminal to limited life prognosis so people who live during some years having suffering and a progressive evolution of their conditions. So, so it's a different perspective. It means that in the model of care and organization, we have to change our perspective to look after this tsunami of needs of all the system. And we have to change this perspective of palliative care being a very late institutional uh, um, approach based in services towards a more flexible and more um, interaction and integrated intervention in all settings of the healthcare system. That's the global approach. And, and then the clinical approach must be much more flexible, the interaction between palliative care services and the other services. And it means that we have to change from this perspective based in services um, to a perspective which is looking at palliative care in everywhere in the healthcare and the social system because patients in need of palliative care are everywhere in the healthcare system. So we cannot base our policy only in implementing palliative care services but in developing policies in all settings of care. And also changing from this institutional approach to the community approach because most of these people are in the community and from the services approach to the population and district approach. So in a population, we can identify very easily now people in need of palliative care who are in all the settings in, the, in this community. So we can know in Australia, in Spain, in many countries, how many people today need a palliative care approach. And I say palliative care approach because we have also work on the changing of taxonomy because palliative care in Spain is very um, linked to specialist uh, services of palliative care but palliative approach is something that we can do and we must do in all settings in the healthcare if we look at the, at the aim of improving the quality of life of persons with advanced chronic conditions and live, limited life prognosis which is a long name but it's a good concept to identify. So that's, that's a, a very important transition in our policies of palliative care in the 21th century. Well, you, you know all this, um, this figure about the policies and the public health policies of palliative care. Um, I want to talk about Spain because um, we have a, in Spain a very good healthcare system. It's free of charge, it's universal coverage, we have a very good uh, system of primary care. So GPs and nurses are public health servants and they, they work together in centers in, in the community. It's, uh, you, if you go to Spain in, in, in few weeks, you can be uh, a good um, uh, client of the healthcare system, free of charge completely. And we have in palliative care, uh, we have 17 uh, states or regional departments of health and we have two well-known models of palliative care. One is Extremadura. Extremadura it's a, it's a region which um, is very well-known about the HAM, but also about palliative care in a very... Yes, uh, and they are very good in, in palliative care for rural communities. So and it's a very small region in Spain, in the west of Spain. And Catalonia is known by the Saucissons of Vic, which is my town which is another good thing to, to eat, but it's also known because the Barcelona football team, you know, we are the best in the world in general. <laughs> uh, so if you are the best in the world, you don't mind if you lose a, a match, you know, it's, it doesn't matter. So that's, and we have uh, self-esteem um, in a good position. <laughs> uh, then um, these two models are the, the two you know, the two jewels of a crown of the uh, palliative care system in Spain. I will talk mainly about Catalonia because I work there, but also because it, the size of Catalonia is very similar to New South Wales. It's 7.3 million habitants. And uh, the different thing, and also it's urban metropolitan, and also we have a very good social health system, 
with a, a program which is called Life to the Years, which is bringing together geriatrics, chronic care, dementia, and palliative care. It's all together since many years ago, 25 years ago. And we have also public funding, funding and universal coverage. And uh, I'm proud of being a palliative care doctor after 25 years or 30 years. I was trained in the UK and I'm recovering from this and the British diet in the last 20 years. Uh, and then, um, but we have to be very happy about the results we achieved because we, we got results very important in improving the quality of life of patients and families. And also we are very efficient in reducing the cost and, uh, and the, the resource utilization in the last years of life. And also we add values to the, to the healthcare system and the social system, looking after vulnerable uh, patients and also pe people who are suffering. So we have to be very proud of what we did in palliative care during many years. But uh, we have also developed the, the program as the WHO uh, demonstration project and we are now uh, presenting the results of 25 years of this project is one of the first in the world. The other was in Kerala and the other in Edmonton in, in Canada. And we share with these two other demonstration projects this uh, developing palliative care. So we were developing palliative care during these 25 years and we achieved quite a high coverage and we are happy with this of cancer, which is 70% of cancer patients are looked after by palliative care services. For non-cancer is around 50%, which is not bad uh, at the moment. And we have uh, um, a lot of doctors there. This is not me there, <laughs> uh, but doctors, uh, clinical doctors in palliative care, and also beds for a million, it's one of the highest in the world. So we have a structure of palliative care which is working quite well and we are happy with this. Extremadura has also a good system of palliative care. They have less beds, but a, a very comprehensive district-based system. So we are both happy about this. And also you can see here all the settings we have. We have a lot of resources for 7 million habitants. And I am outlining this because we are also developing some new services that I will talk about afterwards to look after specific needs that we identify in nursing homes or the social, psychosocial spiritual care for patients and families. If we look at the system, how is it organized? Most of units of palliative care are based in the so-called social health centers, which are intermediate care centers. So a social health center has 100 beds and has 25 years beds of palliative care and then 50 beds of rehabilitation, 20 beds for dementia, subacute care, and long-term care. That's uh, bringing together geriatrics and palliative care at the same, in the same center. And it has been very important to bring together these two perspectives, geriatrics and palliative care together since many years ago. And also we have a lot of home care support teams, it's 73. And also we have palliative care units in nursing homes. Uh, we don't have any hospice in, in Catalonia because we decided to insert palliative care in the existing system of care instead of building hospices. But um, so these are more or less the organizations there. And also we have been working quite a lot in developing district models of organizations. So this is the the result of a benchmark process that we did to identify similar districts and to provide and to promote similar patterns of organization of palliative care in the districts. And again, this is based in populations and districts instead of based in services. It's if your population, you are in a rural district, your model of organization of palliative care must be different from a metropolitan uh, Barcelona-based uh, district. So, uh, so we, we are happy with this because we have developed, in Catalonia we have 39 districts, 18 districts are something like this, six are like this, 
and we have rural districts in the Pyrenees and some other um, uh, places that don't need specific beds for palliative care, just uh, support in going everywhere. But we were happy, but not so happy, because we identified quite a, a lot of things to be improved in our system uh, by a qualitative study of this. And we identified two or three major areas of improvement that we can share, I think, it's because this is universal. One is uh, the low coverage for non-cancer patients, the variability of palliative care quality in many settings of the healthcare system, emergency, uh, also nursing homes, conventional services and primary care. So it was very variable. It depended of the, the, only of the values of professionals. The late intervention and also the psychosocial, spiritual aspects of care were not so developed. We have a chaplain here and then she will be delighted to, to realize this. So we were facing this um, different perspective. It's not only extending palliative care to everybody in all the system, but also deeply um, in improving the model of care, looking at the essential needs of patients and families. So the, the both perspectives, I think we need to improve in the palliative care in the 21st century. So we identified these two challenges that we can share. And again, this is this. So for the first challenges, we were working with people in Australia, Geoff Mitchell from, um, from Brisbane, and also people in Scotland, with um, uh, mainly Scott Mora in the group in Edinburgh, and some European projects to identify the first transition. The first transition is the, a condition in where you have one or several conditions that will kill you in but not immediately in one or two months, in two, three or four years. And the, the nice issue now is that we can identify this situation and this condition very easily in every setting of the healthcare and social care. Three minutes or five minutes for patients and we can identify this situation, which was one of the challenges and dilemmas we got because we didn't know exactly and we were facing this in a dichotomic world. If you are terminal, you, your doctor is Gomez Batista, you will die in one month, we don't replace your hip. If you are not uh, under um, Gomez Batista, we'll replace your hips, uh, many hips that we'll replace even if you will die next day. So this is the dichotomic perspective. But if we are lo located here, this is not dichotomic, this is, we have the challenge, the common challenge that I, I'm delighted to share with you of building up the clinical, the epidemiological, ethical and organizational challenges of the first transition. How can we develop models of organization to look after uh, people that will die in two or three years, identifying them in all settings of healthcare and improving their care in all settings of health and social care. This is the major issue we were facing to expand palliative care to all services. And I think this is a very nice uh, project uh, that we can share uh, between our uh, Spain and also Australia in developing this. And also the discussion about which are the people in need. Well, if we combine these four factors, these four dimensions, one is you have a limited life prognosis, it's true. In fact, we have all a limited life prognosis, as Amanda will say afterwards, more or less. Uh, and then the second is you have a progressive chronic condition, okay? Some people with co chronic conditions will not die immediately or in two or three years. For instance, people with tetraplegia, they can live during many years and they have a chronic condition. And also, if you need a palliative care approach or intervention, because you have pain or um, distress, emotional distress, or um, any kind of distress. So if we combine this, not all patients will have all conditions, but most of patients will have all conditions. Do you agree with this? Please say yes. <laughs> uh, because if not, we can finish the lecture. <laughs> uh, well, this is a key issue because then 
we are working uh, with WHO to establish this criteria to identify openly this type of patients. And then we did also a taxonomic uh, survey with this, uh, the TAC, with the expert committee we set up in the WHO uh, headquarters. And you can see that palliative approach, which is a new name that it's wider than palliative care, it's also well, um, well deserved, and also palliative care and also advanced chronic conditions, more than terminal care or hospice care or um, care of the um, late conditions, okay? So it's true that we have to open the perspective of palliative care, not only as a question of time, but also of the setting in where we are looking after the patients and also the conditions that are more than cancer, okay? That's, that's a key issue. And we can identify this. Uh, I'm glad to, to look at this Estimations based in mortality by Beverly McNamara in, and also Fleece Mortec. Most of the, uh, the estimations of how many people need palliative care were based in mortality and death certificates. But death certificates look after disease, not after conditions. They don't talk about Mrs. Ramona having a, a progressive multimorbidity and deterioration in the last three years. They talk about diabetes or hypertension, or, but not about conditions like dementia, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, okay, but we were working in identifying the prevalence, developing a tool which is very basic in the gold standards framework and the SPICT, but is a bit uh, more developed because we are focusing more in the geriatric syndromes. It's very simple, very easy to do as I speak, or the gold standards framework in any, any setting of care. And this allowed us to look at the epidemiology of prevalence, because the next step we did once we had this tool to identify people was a prevalence population-based study. So we went into a sector and we went to every setting to look at how many people in these settings were in need of palliative care and had a limited like prognosis. And I think this is a good recommendation for any department of health or any health organization. It's to look at how many people in your organization and you can do that in one morning. It's not difficult, it's very simple. And you have also um, this tool and other tools available which are very similar. And these are the results that the population study we did and afterwards we did in several settings. The first is 1.5% of our population are in need of palliative care. This is a huge need and demand of palliative care. And also, in every general practitioners in Spain have between 20 and 25 persons in need of palliative care with a limited life prognosis. And look at what happens in our university hospital. It's 39% of patients there I think it's the same in Sheffield. There is another paper coming from Sheffield, another from Australia, and is, this is universal. In internal medicine, it's 47%, and in the intensive care unit, it's 30%. We were talking with some colleagues uh, working in an intensive care unit, and this is really amazing, isn't it? So it's, it's a huge need and demand in all settings of the healthcare. And what happens in in nursing homes, is, it's up to 70%, and the mortality is 25% per, percent per year. So we are facing a rising tide, a tsunami of needs over in all the system. The most prevalent is a, a woman, so is Mrs. Ramona from my town, is a lady of 82 years old with multimorbidity, diabetes, hypertension, cardiac failure, etc., with a, a starting dementia looked after by her doctor, daughter in the community. She's not in a palliative care service. She's at home and looked after by the community. If we do nothing, she will go to a hospital every month with acute um, conditions, and they will be treated based in the reaction to acute 
a crisis. Do you agree with this? No? Well, that's a normal situation in everywhere. And then the other group is uh, a group of organ failures. So it's people younger, usually prevalent, more prevalent for um, males. And also this is um, uh, usually cardiac failure or COPD or other, other organ failures and also cancer. But look at this, the proportion of cancer to non-cancer is one to seven. So for every cancer advanced patients, we have seven non-cancer patients in need of palliative care in the community. And most palliative care services have exact the opposite uh, uh, prevalence. They look after 70% of their patients are cancer. So if you are in the community, you have to change your perspective be, to adapt to the epidemiology of palliative care in the community. That's a crucial issue. And I think it's the same in Australia as in Spain, of course. So now we are identifying people two years before they will die as a median, that, that will be the median. And then uh, after this, we propose to the Department of Health a program, a comprehensive program to identify and look after these patients in the community. Uh, based in uh, training the GPs and the nurses in the community to identify and look after these patients earlier in their e evolution. And these are the results of this identification. It's more than 150,000 patients are identified as a chronic complex patients and uh, around 50,000 this year are identified as patients with palliative care needs, okay? So that's, that's a huge revolution in the epidemiology of palliative care and it's based in the community perspective, right? So, and we are conducting a lot of research in hospitals and in other uh, issues and in other settings. And also we are working and we can share also this, what to do with patients, what to do in services, because all services we call the marinating, marinating process, which is all the pieces of this dish must be marinated, which is adapting all services to the growing needs of the epidemiology of palliative care, the new perspective, which is all settings involved, all professionals involved, and also uh, these are the actions we propose also with WHO and Scott Murray uh, lately. And then uh, it's well defined what to do in many services to improve this. And also the other perspective is population based. So we can go to a district. If the district is, has 100,000 population, we know that 1,500 1, people are in need of palliative care in this district. And they are distributed and we know how many will be in every setting of this, and we can estimate this, and we can measure this. So this is a global perspective instead of this a perspective based only in services, okay? It's a population and district-based perspective. Well, the, and these are actions to introduce. So um, when we started to do so, we had ethical, and we have a, an ethical discussion afterwards, one of the discussions we got, and it was uh, very active in Spain, was uh, the, the risk and the benefits of identifying earlier these patients in all the settings. And we identified the risks, which is, you know, a stigma, it's a risk, and also losing uh, curative opportunities in the system, because, you know, some people will not understand that you, you will live during two or three years and you, they consider you a terminal patient uh, that will not need a hip re replacement. So it's very important also to reduce these risks and also uh, emphasize all the benefits that will have this Mrs. Ramona if she has the opportunity to have a multidimensional assessment, starting an advanced care planning and also starting a case management process. And this is really a, a big benefit for most of these patients. But it's true that we face also this, so we ask many ethical committees to work with us in, redu in reducing these risks and increasing the benefits of this. And also, 
we got a prognostic debate, and we are, this is universal also in all over the world, but we know that if you do that in, properly, you identify people with a high risk of dying, the median survival is two years, more or less, but if you are identifying a hospital, it's 70% of mortality in one year. So we are identifying people that will have a risk of dying in the next one or two or three years. It doesn't matter the prognostic so far, but it's important to identify people who have palliative care needs, irrespective of prognosis, but keeping in mind that you also are identifying people with risk. So we are changing the model from a late recognition based in institution and based in crisis of care and based in emergency services and acute bed hospitals towards a model in which the identification is done in the community two or three years ago uh, before and it's starting a preventive model of care based in advanced care planning and also a case management, which is not reactive, it's preventive and propositive. It's active and look at this. It will take some time to do so, but we have to be um, tenaces, uh, uh, straightforward to do so. So we have to be very, very strict on this. Uh, but also the other debate we got in Spain is how to adapt palliative care service to this tsunami, because most of palliative care services are based in cancer patients or are institutional. Some of them are home care based, but we are trained to look after terminal cancer patients. So there are challenges to address with palliative care services, mainly training, mainly also changing the organization and the perspective and getting out from our comfort area to look with other services how to um, improve the care of many patients in all services in the healthcare. It's in, in summary, it's changing the perspective from a perspective based in your services in a perspective based in your population. So, and, and having this responsibility. And also, the national programs, if you look at internet, most of them are not adapted to this. So we have to, a lot of work to be done, changing the policies of palliative care to adapt to these uh, changing needs of patients and families. Finally, I want to talk about the essential needs. How is it going? Good. Uh, so we were working also in the essential needs which will de we defined spirituality, dignity, love and tenderness, autonomy, hope is also an essential need when you are facing a difficult situation of end of life. And also we were working on this, but also we, we had this, this good new, which is a bank in Spain, uh, was interested in developing services of palliative care. So uh, eight years ago, we designed a program to implement services of spiritual and emotional support to existing palliative care services. So it's a support team of psychologists and social workers giving support to existing services to look after the emotional, social and spiritual care of patients and families. And we were happy to develop this and the result is that we have implemented 42 full-time teams in Spain. It's unique in the world because it's funded by a bank, which is a curious thing in general. <laughs> so if you have to change money, please use this bank eh? <laughs> because my salary is also depending on this. <laughs> uh, but uh, but uh, no, in serious, this is a huge program of 42 full-time services in all over Spain and we have looked after 200,000 people in, in seven years in psychosocial and spiritual care. So that's, uh, and also we have results of effectiveness and satisfaction and also families and stakeholders. So this is also a way of implementing, so we have to seduce some banks here, if you, <laughs> we can tomorrow have time to do so, uh, but we have to, um, 
be able to identify ways of ask, uh, answering to these challenges. One is extending, the other is improving the model of care to look after essential needs. That's, that's the summary of the things we can do. And finally, it's bringing together palliative care and chronic care models because palliative care is the soul of chronic care models. Many chronic care models are based you know, in managerial issues. It's, I do that for Mrs. Ramona not using emergency service. I do that for reducing the need of beds. But the key issue is to look after Mrs. Ramona in a proper way, comprehensively and integrated. And one of the results is that she will not come to the emergency service so many times. But the aim of this is improving the quality of life of Mrs. Ramona. Is not. So this is the soul of any chronic care program. And this is a good slogan. We can insert souls in healthcare systems and also in, uh, also in banks because they can have also a soul. <laughs> okay? So this is the change. This is also the change uh, across the, the length of the development. And as I was saying, the palliative care approach is the soul of chronic care programs. It's inserting values and good care into the chronic care models. Uh, finally, well, I have been also in the WHO headquarters as medical officer, and we developed this initiative of palliative care for all over the world, which is, we designed this and we elaborated the strategic plan that with the resolution of uh, this May, to 2014, and we started with a needs assessment, which is devastating because you know only 25% of patients in the world have access to opioids and have access to palliative care service, which is a huge need and demand. So I think everything you can do to help other countries to develop good policies of palliative care or your clinical excellence is something that you must do because this is a, a sign of dignity and your, com your commitment to dignity in the world. So be, be very uh, open with this because we need help in developing policies all over the world to all patients, all conditions, all time, all needs, all professionals, all settings, all countries. This is the, the way forward for palliative care approach as an indicator of human rights and dignity and respect for dignity. It's the best indicator for a, a country and for that I'm also proud to be in Spain because we have been looking after this in a proper way and you are doing the same here uh, in Australia. So to respond to these challenges, we have some responses and we need leadership of the governments, of the departments of health to develop this uh, wider perspective of palliative care with this public health approach and also inserting also the essential needs approach and developing models of care. That will be a very nice area of cooperation between us because we share these challenges and we can share the solutions learning from each other. So that's a long name, but we have to find an acronym for You are experts in acronyms here because I, un I don't understand most of the things you, you say in, in the streets, you know, so you have to find uh, an acronym for this. Uh, I can help in this because I made a lot of acronyms in Spain. Um, but the, the synthesis of it is comprehensive and integrated care for people with advanced chronic conditions and their families all over the settings of health and care and social service. Okay? Do you agree with this? So this is the challenge we have chair in the next few years before we will be clients of this system. <laughs> Thank you very much.